And the question is, should we pray? Now, the Bible suggests in many places that prayer is very important. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And when we look at that verse, we can recognise straight away, I think, how important the Bible thinks prayer is, how important God thinks prayer is. We're told in the context of rejoicing and uh, thinking positively about the message of God that we should be praying without ceasing. We should be praying always, that we should be giving thanks in all circumstances, because we recognise that everything that we go through and everything we endure, everything we enjoy or find challenging in life is part of the will of God and that he has a purpose and a plan for us. So the short answer to should we pray is yes, we should. Uh, and the Bible is emphatic about that. We can use a parable of Jesus as recorded for us in Luke chapter 18 to take us a little bit further when we think about this question about should we pray. Let's just spend a moment reading that passage together. Luke chapter 18 and reading from verse 1 to 8. It says, now Jesus was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord Jesus said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So here we've got a parable, a story told by Jesus with the character of a judge who was uh, here described as being unwilling and unjust. The other character is the widow who came to him asking for help. Uh, and the contrast then is made between this unjust judge and the attitudes and the way the Lord God would act with the people that came to him in prayer. So just pick out a few bits that we can find in this parable that are helpful for our subject tonight. Jesus starts off in the very beginning of this parable by saying that we should pray at all times and not lose heart. So we should be praying then during the good times to celebrate, to praise our God. We should be, celeb we should be praying at the bad times. And we should be praying at all of the other times, that the, in the middle times, when things are neither good nor bad. Those are times when we should be praying too. Very quickly here, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ helps us to realise that prayer is a, a way of us not losing heart, not becoming discontented with the challenges that we might face in our lives. We move on to just think about some of the other detail here, because in contrast to the unrighteous judge, we can see here that God can't be worn out by our prayers. The judge was worried about this woman continually coming and wearing him down. But actually, we see here that there is not even a notion that that is possible with God. God cannot be worn out by our prayers. Rather, it's his desire to bring justice for his people who pray to him. And we just notice here again that prayers are made day and night, all through the day and all through the night, we have the opportunity to come to our God in prayer. And then just to pick out one final point from this parable of Jesus, again, 
But this stands in contrast to the unjust judge who uh, was debating and delaying because he didn't really want to do something. That's not the case with God. In contrast to the unjust judge, God won't delay in bringing about his justice, won't delay in bringing about his will. Now, again, just a note that that doesn't mean to say that he will always give us what we ask for. And we're going to come back to look at that specific question with what I think is a very powerful example a little bit later on. So if prayer is important, then perhaps we should spend a moment thinking about what prayer is. I'd like to suggest to you that perhaps in its simplest form, prayer is a conversation with God. It's a way that we can build a relationship with him in the same way that we might have a conversation with somebody we know um, to build a relationship with them. It is, in essence, I don't think any different. What it is a bit different, however, about is that prayer is also a demonstration from us that we believe in God's existence, that we believe in his power to affect change and that we put our trust in his purpose and in his ways. There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, which is a, a chapter all about having faith. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God, and that brings together this idea of coming to him in prayer, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So by praying to God, then we actively demonstrate that we believe that he exists. And by having faith in him, we demonstrate our, uh, our faith. Um, that he has a power to affect change. And so we can put our trust in his purpose. Uh, and just a, a final note, perhaps a practical point, that with anything that is something that we've never done before, um, it might feel a bit peculiar or, or a bit strange to start with to, to say a prayer. And I think it's really important just to recognise that that is okay um, and that prayer is something that gets easier as with most things that we do in life the more that we do it the same with reading god's word the more that we do it the more we can become comfortable with uh, the things that we're doing so just moving on from that uh, the question is uh, are there different types of prayer uh, and the answer to that is yes there are different types of prayer and the bible is full of lots of different examples for us to think about um, one of those would be, or one type of prayer would be adoration, worship and praise. Uh, and, and this type of prayer would focus on God, on his character, on his power and the fact that he knows everything. Uh, and so we would praise him uh, and we would recognise then that there is a reason to worship God for what he's done um, and also what he plans to do, his purpose with the earth. In our prayers, we can make petitions or supplications. We can ask for something. Perhaps we can ask for forgiveness, uh, recognising that we don't always behave in the right way uh, and that we do, unfortunately, at times in our lives, act in a way that is contrary to the character of our God. We might also come to our God in prayer to ask him to do something for us. Uh, and again, we're going to look at that um, specific point a little bit later on. There's an idea of intercession, which is a long word, which the Bible uses to describe in one respect about how we might offer a prayer for somebody else. How we might, in our prayers, make a petition or a supplication to God on somebody else's behalf. And so that's the idea of intercession. And um, Jesus does that, actually, um, for his disciples and for us um, in John chapter 17, if, if you wanted to pick up a verse that would uh, or a chapter that would bring you through that idea. Another aspect of prayer would be this idea of consecration, of, of giving ourselves over to God's purpose, of dedicating, if you like, ourselves, an aspect of our lives, our minds, our, our actions, something that we're doing very specifically or, or, or generally 
um, to the purpose of God. Uh, and then last, but by no means least, this idea of thanksgiving, of giving thanks uh, for the blessings, for the wonderful things that we have in our lives, recognising that these things come from the hand and in the purpose of the God who created the earth. I move on then to, to consider just for a moment about the question of how should we pray? And, and again, we've said this already, but there are many examples in the Bible of prayers uh, and we would do well to, to, to look at all of them, but we don't have time to do that this evening. I'd like us to just pick out one particular prayer and it's known perhaps most commonly as the Lord's Prayer and we can read it together in Matthew chapter 6. I haven't got this on the screen so if you want to turn this up in your Bible then it's Matthew chapter 6 and we'll read from verse 6 to verse 15. Now Matthew chapter 6 or Matthew rather is um, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6 and verse six, Jesus said to his disciples, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses. So when we come to think about this prayer that Jesus suggests his disciples might think about when they're praying, he gives us three important principles about how we should pray. And the first is there in verse six for us. He says that prayer is not something that we should do to show off or to be seen by other people. And he suggests here that when we're praying, particularly for ourselves, then we should do that perhaps in secret. Um, there's no need to do that in public. Uh, now, there are occasions where um, we as Christadelphians or, or other people that believe in the Lord God would pray as a group. And that's, I think, a slightly different context. But here we recognise that prayer is something, a relationship between us and our Heavenly Father. The next principle here is in verse seven for us, and it says, that we don't need to use lots of words. He says specifically to, em to, to not heap up empty phrases uh, be because it's not important about how many words we say or how complicated the words we use are, but rather that we come to God in prayer and express our real heart's desires and our concerns to him in prayer. And then the last principle there is in verse eight, which just reminds us about the fact that God knows everything already. And so God knows what you're going to say. So you don't need to use lots of words and you don't need to use it to show off. Come to him in secret and just say what's on your mind and in your heart. And then Jesus goes on to give us this example prayer, doesn't he? And we can see how this prayer has within it um, lots of the, if you like, types of prayer that we just thought about. Jesus reminds us about our position before God. Uh, the first line of the prayer is our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're, we're praising God and worshipping him, recognising that we as his children are, are humbled before him before his all powerfulness and before his all knowingness. He reminds us of our hope in God's purpose and in God's kingdom. It says your kingdom come, your will be done. He reminds us of really how simple our actual needs are, how basic the things that we need in life would be. In that phrase, give us this day our daily bread. 
how much more than that do we need? And, and when we're praying for things that we perhaps would like or desire or think would be useful, then we've got to really, I think, reference that against this question, this statement here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. And then the remainder of the prayer goes on to remind us, and it's the stress of the prayer at the end here, about our need for forgiveness. Forgive us our sins, our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And also to remind us about how we act with other people, that if we do not forgive others, then it, it, how would our Father forgive us? Uh, a real important lesson for us to learn straight out of this example prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't the only way we can pray, but it can help us to think about perhaps what we're saying, that uh, we can help us to think about how saying a prayer might feel to us, particularly if we've not done it before. So just to stop for a moment and, and, and reflect on what we thought about, I'd suggest to you that prayer is the privilege that we all can have of having a conversation with our creator and our God. Uh, and what a privilege it is then to be able to say a prayer to our God. The subject of tonight's talk is prayer and it being powerful. So, so how is prayer powerful then? And I think we do well to, to pick up a passage from the New Testament and a, a letter called James. James chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and we read this together off the screen. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we notice straight away that this passage is definitely talking about prayer, isn't it? Over and over again. In this letter, in this passage, we, we hear this word prayer. Just out of interest and, and more in passing, really, again, it, it touches on this idea of people praying together for the same cause, uh, making a communal prayer, if you like. So, so that is definitely here for us in scripture to read. And there are other passages that we could turn to to pick that up as well. But let's just focus a little bit on, on how this passage suggests that prayer might be powerful. Uh, and we can start to see that here in verse 15 specifically. So verse 15 suggests for us that prayer can save the sick. But we just notice how this verse says that this might be done. Uh, I suggest to you that the ultimate salvation, if you like, from our sickness here in James chapter 5 and verse 15 it is really that we're saved by resurrection and, and having been forgiven of our sins. So this idea of being raised up is the same language that's used about the Lord Jesus Christ raising from being raised from the dead. Uh, and if he has committed sins, then he will be forgiven. Uh, and again, this same idea of being forgiven of our sins and being saved, if you like, from our human nature. Uh, and so this brings us back to that point that we highlighted in the Lord's Prayer about how we should pray for forgiveness for our sins. Because in verse 16, the last verse that we read together here from James, we can see how it's important that we confess our sins, that we need to confess our sins, yes, to God in prayer, but also, interestingly, to each other, so that we can help each other by praying for each other that we might overcome um, by the grace of God the trials of our lives. The prayer for forgiveness or for the healing from sin brings mankind to a closer relationship with God. Then if we recognise where we might stray from the commandments and the principles of our Heavenly Father, then we can see how we might become more like him and his son. And so our thinking might become more in line with his purpose. 
Uh, and so then we can see the last line here of this passage really comes into its, it really becomes significant that a prayer offered in submission to God's will and his purpose has the ultimate power because of a surety it will be effective. If we're praying with the purpose of God in our minds, if we're praying such that we submit ourselves to the will and the purpose of God in heaven, then that prayer is of great power. Let's just pick up a couple of examples of how this might be the case. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, an example from the Old Testament, and it's actually uh, just the next verse in James. So James chapter 5, verse 17 reads like this. It's talking about a man called Elijah. Elijah was a man of like passions with us. And then that's basically just saying that Elijah was a man. He was a man that was driven. He was a man that followed God, but was frustrated very often by the challenges that he was faced in his life. So Elijah was a man of like passions with us passions with us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and it rained not in the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now God responded directly to the prayer of Elijah but why did he do it? Let me take a moment to look at the story in 1 Kings chapter 16. We can see that the people of God, the Israelites, the, the children of God, had lost their way. They were no longer following God's commandments. They were not listening to his word. They were straying from his purpose. And so the Bible talks about the word of God being like rain. It draws an analogy between the rain falling from heaven and nourishing and watering God's people uh, and the word of God nourishing the hearts and the minds of God's people. And so Elijah prays for the rain to stop so that the people would realise that they had stopped listening to God's word. Now, Elijah's petition, his prayer in this case, was in perfect harmony with God's desire and plan. And so this prayer of Elijah came to pass. Now, this isn't true of all Elijah's prayers, and I think that's important for us to recognise. But in this particular instance, the point of Elijah's prayer and God's response to Elijah was to make the people realise that it was only by submitting to God that they could live. This was a prayer of faith then designed to bring healing from the sickness of sins, and convert the sinful people of Israel from the errors of their ways. Again, we come back to the same idea that we saw in James chapter uh, five and the verses just before, and the same idea that we read of in Matthew, in Matthew chapter six, when we were reading about the Lord's prayer. But that raises a question for us, I think, doesn't it? Because it's not always possible for God to grant us what we ask for, not even for men who are full of faith, for men and women who are full of faith, the most faithful men and women. And there's a very good example of that for us in the Bible. And it's the example of Jesus himself and the prayer that he prayed to God or the prayers actually that he made to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, we know, don't we, that Jesus is the son of God. We can see in the Bible that he never went against the wishes of his father. And the Bible talks about Jesus being the reflection of the character of God, his father. From the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus knew that he was going to be put on trial, that he was going to be falsely accused and that he would be condemned to death by public crucifixion. Uh, uh, we can recognise, uh, as horrible as it has, is to think about it, uh, that that is a brutally painful way for someone to die. Jesus also knew that in doing this, that in dying as a man who had done no sin, that he would provide a way for all mankind to overcome the problems of sin and death, uh, and that this was the will and the purpose of God. Now, on the night that he was arrested, Jesus offered his prayers to God. And we, we can read those in Matthew chapter six and from verse 36. 
And we've got them here on the screen for us. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 says, when Jesus went with them, that's his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here a while while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. So we can see in this passage here, that an hour of distress for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he prayed three times, I've highlighted them for us in, in, on the screen, that this cup, that this duty, that this um, responsibility might pass from him. The Lord Jesus Christ was asking his father if there was any other way that his purpose might be fulfilled. But we just notice again that on the three occasions that he said this prayer, he also submitted himself completely to the will of God. He says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So three times the Lord Jesus Christ prayed to his father and asked him if there was another way. But if there wasn't another way, then he would submit to his father's will. Now, did God allow this cup, this um, responsibility to pass away from Jesus as he had prayed? Uh, and the answer to that is no, he didn't. Uh, well, was this because Jesus was being punished for a lack of, uh, for, for a lack of faith or being sinful? Uh, and the answer is no. We know that he never sinned and that he was a man that was full of faith. Well, so did God just ignore the prayer of Jesus then? Or well, the answer here again it is no. Perhaps for those of you who have children, we can imagine the pain and the suffering that, that God was caused by the fact that he knew his son was going to die. He doesn't ignore him. Was the prayer of Jesus effective and powerful? Well, the answer to that is yes. As we've seen before, if, if our lives and our prayers are aligned with submission to God's will, then they cannot be anything else apart from effective and powerful. Now, that doesn't mean that we necessarily get, as is the case here for the Lord Jesus Christ, what we might initially desire. Because Jesus did die. It's apparent from the Bible that there was no other way. but. He was raised again to life. The Lord God did hear the prayer of his son. Our merciful God allowed his son to die so that we might have the hope of life. His will was done. And I think when we take a moment to think about what we've talked about so far, we're left with a question, which is, well, how can I be sure that prayer works? Because the reality is that we do have to acknowledge that God is not active in our lives today in the same way that he was in the lives of the Old Testament prophets or, or through his Holy Spirit gifts, for example, in the New Testament. But we are assured by the Bible that God is continually at work in the world whether that be through his angels, that although they be hidden from our view, they're, they're present in the world. 
we're assured that God is continually at work in that the kingdoms of men, we're told, are ultimately under the control of God and his purpose. God has also made sure for us that his words, his principles and his purpose have been recorded for us to read in his Bible. Uh, it's a Bible that we can read at any point, at any time. It's on our phones. It's on the Internet. It's in a book. It's everywhere. It's always accessible. And through re reading it, we can grow in our faith and we can meditate upon the very mind of God such that our desires and our purpose might become more like his. That we can put that mind, put that nourishing word of God into our minds, that we can be watered, like we've already talked about, watered and grow in God's word. Because God will bring about his ultimate purpose. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth and will establish a kingdom and that kingdom will be ruled in righteousness. And at that time, he will ultimately remove all sin, sorrow, pain and death. The subject of such a large amount of our prayer, surely, is the challenges of sin, sorrow, pain and death. So just to bring our thoughts to a close. When we're talking about the subject of the power of prayer, I'd like to suggest to you that the power of prayer is that it brings us close to God, a God who created the earth and gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might die for us and for his purpose. The power of prayer that it brings us close to God, to his thoughts and to this purpose. We've seen and thought about the fact that it's not always possible for God to give us what we ask for in our prayers, but that he will always hear them. He will never tire of hear, hearing our prayers. He will take the prayers of those who have believed into account. He will forgive sin. He will count faith for righteousness and he will offer us life. I'd like to just suggest to you as we close that the ultimate power of prayer I think is that God is always there to listen that whatever trials we feel we're in whatever mindset we are in whether it be joyous elation or the very depths of despair. God is always there to listen. And in his listening, he will forgive us where we fall short. He will remember and count our faith for righteousness. And he will offer us life. Prayer is powerful. Thank you for listening.